A warm Christian greeting to each of you this evening. I would like to begin this evening by referring to something I said last night. The job of a teacher is to work himself out of a job because I can never tell you everything that you should know. So I brought a few books with me over here that I'm just going to introduce. <clears throat> most, of, <clears throat> most of you will probably not do in-depth studies of Anabaptist Christian history. You like overview. My favorite book for the overview is Smith's Story of the Mennonites. It's a fifth edition. It looks thick, but it's easy to read. They're very branches of Anabaptism. That made a difference. Yeah. <laughs> what are the three branches? Amish, Mennonite, Hutterite. Hutterite. Swiss Brethren. And Dutch Mennonite. Thank you. Those are the three. Now, I found out last night that... Uh, some of you would appreciate some reasons why I say you folks are not Mennonites. So I'll do that after I'm finished with the books. Okay? So these, both of these cover all three of those streams. <clears throat> How many of you have read this book, The Kingdom Turned the World Upside Down? Only a few of you. The rest of you owe yourself this book. This is very significant. It gets at the heart of some of what I want to talk about tonight. <clears throat> Probably most of you are aware that the German Mennonites eventually became Nazis. Okay? It's our descendants... I'm sorry, our ancestors that did not come to America and the Dutch Mennonites that did not move to Russia, the people who stayed in Germany. This is a story. It chronicles the 100-year period and shows how the Germans lost their non-resistance just a little bit at a time so that by World War I, they're ready to become soldiers and there were 400, approximately 400 Mennonite soldier deaths in World War I. Well, they didn't get there.
called the MEA, Mennonite Experience in America. This particular book, the first one, is The Establishment of Mennonite Communities in America, 1683 to 1790. Thank you. Okay? This is the first book of the series. The second book in the series is Peace, Faith, Nation, Volume 2, Mennonites and Amish in a 19th century America, the 1800s. And then from there is Vision, Doctrine, War, Mennonite Identity and Organization in America, 1890 to 1930. And this one brings it to the more recent Mennonites in American Society, 1930 to 1970. Okay, one of the things I want to tell you tonight is how I mentioned last night that the Anabaptists actually changed the course of Western history. I want to tell you that story. But are you aware that the most recent way that Anabaptists have impacted history is Wisconsin versus Yoder? And this book ends right before that, so it doesn't cover that. But the freedoms we have today to do education in the phase two part of Christian education came about because Wisconsin versus Yoder. And the entire homeschool opportunity opened up as a result of Wisconsin versus Yoder. The question in Wisconsin versus Yoder, who owns the children? We always thought we did, right? But for the state, they would understand they own the children. And every day, they have little children standing in school saying, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I did that for a number of years. How many of you stood there and did the same thing? So what was, what was expected of us? If we pledged to do that, what was expected of us later? Someone tell me. That's right. When it comes to wartime, we pledged that we would be ready. Does it make sense for little non-resistant children to stand there and do that? No. <clears throat> is there anybody in this congregation tonight's name is Landis? Anybody have Landis uh, ancestors? Really? I thought this was Landis territory, at least somewhat. Well, this is the story of Hans Landis. This is the last Anabaptist martyr, 1614, 70 years old. The man wouldn't listen to the state. They got so upset with him, they decided one day to cut his head off. And so they did. One of the last things Hans Landis said, the, the uh, executioner asked him, well, Hans, do you have anything more to say while you're here on the earth? Hans says, no, I've said everything I need to say. Have you forgiven everybody, Hans? Yes, Hans says, I've forgiven everybody. And he looked at the executioner with a twinkle in his eye and said, even you. And so he kneeled down, off went his head. And the people were upset, very upset, so much so that's the last that they actually killed an Anabaptist in Europe. This is a complete story. On the left side of this book, it's German. On the right-hand side, it's English. And so if you have any kind of Landis connections, you ought to check this book out. Okay, and there's a bunch of other books here, and I don't want to take the time to uh, go further with that. You can check those out at your you own know, interest. Okay, so now why are we not uh, Mennonite? So take a look at this chart over here. This line at the top has to do with the Dutch. These, except the bottom line here, has to do with Switzerland. The very bottom line here is Hutterite, which is Moravia. And maybe some night I'll show you a map to give you some perspective on that. Okay, so this, I think I pointed out to you, is our line. You notice it starts right here because this only starts in this country. The Swiss Brethren actually started here. Okay? So you notice down here that uh, the first word that Mennonite arrives is here, 
which says Mennonites where we start. So that gives you a little clue as to maybe why we were called Mennonite. Take a look. You can't see this from back there, but you'll notice that there's a line from up here, down here, and there's a line from down here, up here. <clears throat> the Swiss government wanted us out. We were not leaving. They cut Hans Landis's head off, and we still wouldn't leave. We loved the territory, and they put more pressure on us. They increased the taxes, and we still wouldn't leave. And they got increasingly strict. They didn't know what to do. Maybe sometime if I have time, I'll give you more of the story. And so finally, the, tight, the thing was so tight that we eventually moved to the Palatinate, which is north up the Rhine River. And by the way, that's where we learned Pennsylvania Dutch. At least some of you did. I never did. My parents didn't even speak it, so I don't know it. But that's where Pennsylvania Dutch came from. OK, so how is that really to Mennonite? Well, when the Swiss government was putting pressure on us, they wanted to know what we believed. But we had nothing written. And so we gave them the 1632 Dortry Confession, which is written by the Dutch, except that we didn't really believe everything in it. The Dortry Confession talks about the ban and shunning. Well, we didn't believe that. It also includes an article in the feet washing, but we didn't practice that. And so, since we said officially this is what we believed, well, then the government referred to us as menace. You know, it's just like these comes from these Dutch people. And then some of us were so poor we couldn't pay our way across, and the Dutch was, were very gracious to us and helped give us finances so we could come to America. So it's at least those two reasons why we're called Mennonites. But really and truly, we were not. Now, enter Jacob Amon. Jacob Amon and the Amish people developed around the end of, about right in here, right before 1700. There was a man from our background by the name of Ulrich Miller who began to preach down in Bern. And a group of people came into the Anabaptist movement. 200 new surnames came in. And these are like first generation Christians. And uh, they got to reading this Dortry Confession, and they said, uh, why aren't we doing what we say we believe? By this time, our people, the Zurichers and the Bernies, were getting lax. We were getting tired of persecution. And so we said things like this. They want to baptize our babies. OK, well, let them put a little water in our babies. That's not called baptism. It just, it just gets us off the hook. Would you do that? Well, that's called Nicodemism. It's a kind of compromise. But it got the government off our back. And Jacob Amon and his other friends said, uh, I don't think so. That's a compromise. You shouldn't be doing that. And furthermore, why aren't, if we say that this sort of confession is what we believe, why don't we practice what it is? And our leader, Hans Rice, says, um, um, <clears throat> some of this stuff is innovation. New stuff. We don't believe this. For example, the ban and shunning and feet washing. New stuff. Can't believe that. This is 150 years after Anabaptism was born in Zurich. And so there's other issues in this. If you want to, there's, a, there's a book called uh, uh, Letters of the Amish Division. You can read it. It's still available today. I, the, the old Mennonites are the ones that wrote the story for years, until just about less than 20 years ago, an Amishman wrote their version. You know, whoever writes the history decides what's in there, right? OK, so finally, an Amishman wrote their side. And when he wrote that story, it's, paid, it's chapter two in Unserlite. How many of you have Unserlite at your house? It's two volumes by Leroy Beachy. Do you have that? I am impressed. Are you Amish? That's why. OK, so every Amish family story is in there. What was your maiden name? Oh, well, of course it's in there. Of course. Okay. 
So, yeah, you're Fisher. Yeah, your story's in there. Do you have a copy of Munster Light? Okay, so when Leroy Beachy wrote this, chapter 2, it's 85 pages with 565 footnotes because he knew that that particular chapter would go under the microscope by the old Mennonites to see if this is true. And uh, I asked John Roth, who is the professor of history at Goshen, and he said, uh, the basic story stands. Uh, we, we, we would quibble a few things, uh, some details and so on. And so from then on, I refused to call this the Amish division because the Mennonites were just as faulty as the Amish were. We were always taught that Jacob Amon was rash and kind of a naughty man. He wasn't really uh, such a good church leader, right? That's what we were always taught. Well, do you know that Pons Rice was just as obstinate? But he's our man, so he has to be good. The other guy has to be bad. So that's the way it is when you write history. And so it's the Amish separation. And the reason it is is because these were first-generation Christians who are trying to be uh, consistent and faithful. You know, people who are in the faith from generation to generation eventually get soft, and we get kind of relaxed, and we get to pay attention to other things, and we're not as sharp as we used to be. And um, that's where many of us are. So we'll just leave that. Okay, if you want to ask me more about that uh, later, you may. <clears throat> now, let me tell you this before I get into the main part of the evening. <clears throat> I said that the Anabaptist people pioneered the whole concept of separation of church and state. Okay, I told you the other night, last night, that they understood traditionally you have to have church and state, warp and woof, fabric, like this. And it could not exist if you try to separate. It's called anarchy. And so they arrested Anabaptism on that as a criminal charge. And then comes William Penn, who has Pennsylvania, and he wants to make a home for these persecuted people, and he's not going to do a state church. He is going to try the impossible with what is called the, the holy experiment. And lo and behold, it worked to everybody's surprise. It couldn't have worked, but it did. All these various groups among each other, and they were, these were German uh, uh, Mennonites and Amish and Moravians and Brethren and Presbyterians and Lutherans. They're all going back and forth and doing their business and getting along without fighting. And while this is happening in New England, they're doing it the old way. The Puritans were very much for church state. You know that from your school studies. If you slept in church, you know that somebody came with an, uh, a long pole and a feather and tickled your nose to get you awake. I mean, they had to force Christianity. And if you were lied and you know, in you're caught, they might dunk you or put you in the pillory. And one of the things that they, they would make you stand, put your hand in your heads in the pillory, and then it's okay if people throw rotten tomatoes and eggs at you. That's, that's your problem. You're being punished. That's just fine. Church state, intact in New England. In fact, the Puritans up there killed at least two Quakers. At least two. Church state. And down in Virginia, it's the Anglican church. Puritans were up in New England. They were the, the stricter ones. But down in Virginia is still state church. Maryland was a Catholic colony. And in between was Pennsylvania, where this religious freedom was going on. And when it came time to write the Constitution, there had been enough time, almost 100 years, for William Penn's whole experiment to work itself out. And by uh, 1783, when they wrote the U.S. Con Constitution, 100 years had gone by, and and they put it in the Constitution as the First Amendment that the nation shall not establish a religion nor prevent the free exercise thereof, along with freedom of the press, freedom of assembly, and freedom of speech. It's like, now, everybody believes that. 
And the United States is trying to export it across the globe. But when it comes to Islam, there is no such thing. Islam is church and state. When you ever hear a Sharia law, that's a way to make the Quran workable in the state. And to try to give those kind of people free of religion, it goes against everything they're taught. It just not, doesn't fit their worldview. Okay? So many of our young people don't know the great gift that our people have given Western civilization. And now, as you, you pay attention to current events, you'll notice that uh, freedom of speech and all the freedoms we have are presently under attack. And I don't know what God's going to do. I just know this. I want you to pay real close attention to what I share shortly here because this is key. What I have to share tonight is bedrock. It has to do with why we've stayed around for 500 years. It's why God could use our people so uh, influentially in the past. And he will again today in the measure in which we're faithful to him. And I don't know how much you know, but there are opportunities opening up in the Muslim world as I speak that we are uniquely positioned to be able to address. It makes, about, about, it makes me shiver when I think about the opportunities that are unfolding in front of our eyes. If I have time sometime, I would tell you a story that I'm presently involved with. And it has unfolded further since I got to Pennsylvania last week. And I will just stop right there. Okay, so let's get started with uh, what we have for tonight. Tonight we're going to talk about the four stages of growth. It grows out partly for what we talked about on Sunday morning in the Sunday School lesson, that you may grow up into him in all things. Well, this is the way I understand it works. All Christians go through this. You cannot get to stage four without going through stage one, two, and three. And I'll explain more what I mean by that later on. Under this line is what we call unregenerate living, sinful behavior. What I say tonight has nothing to do with people who are below this line. How much loss does the kingdom of Christ sustain when I settle less for less than the best? The Holy Spirit is urging us up through all those stages. And we will naturally be moved this way unless we say no to him. And he is such a gentleman, he'll step back and he'll say, okay, I will work in your life when you're ready. I will not push you, make you do anything. He's such a gentleman. Stage one is immature. Stage two is okay. Stage three is good, but there's better and best up here. So what do we mean by that? Here's this line again. Below this is ignorance of actual spiritual life and real power. The people who do not have Christ have a blinded mind. They cannot understand the wonderful things of the Spirit of God because the flesh is controlled. Spiritual truths are spiritually discerned. So stage one has to do with the knowledge of. Stage two includes the knowledge of, but it includes the talk of as well. And stage three is the most dangerous stage to be in, but it raises the question, is this real? How does one get it? Remember last night I talked to you about the Anabaptist martyrs were killed outside the castles of Ghent, uh, the wall, versus the ones that were killed inside? And stage four is the experience of spiritual life and power. This is what changes the world.
Okay, so down below here, this is what we consider at least the new birth. We've made a choice to follow Christ. And so we're not assuming anything now in an unconverted situation. Stage one, we call the carnal stage. In 1 Corinthians, he says, are you not yet carnal and walk as men whenever there's divisions among, among you? Okay, so that's even a scriptural term to talk about being carnal as a Christian. And there's a lot of ups and downs. By the way, every single person who knows Christ begins at this stage. How long we stay in this stage is our choice. The Holy Spirit will lead us on to the next stage. Stage two is the sacral stage. And sacral, the sacral stage is all about, well, let me say, in stage one, eventually, a person says, you know, there must be more to Christianity than this. I don't see everybody around me operating on this level. There, there's something that we need to move on to. Of course there is. The Holy Spirit will take us on to stage two. And stage two is about getting it right. It has to do with believing the correct things, practicing the correct things, just performance, just doing it right, being right. Better and better at being right, more perfectly correct. And after a while, the same question rises. Well, there has to be something more than this. And so sometimes a person reaches out and asks the question, what is behind this? Why are we in this situation? And if you ask a certain person, they'll say, uh, I don't know, but just shut up. Don't rock the boat. Don't ask questions like that. Just do what they say and shut up. Okay? That's the safe thing to do. So many times people shut up. But eventually the people are told to shut up. If they were moved to ask those questions, we'll likely have more questions. And if we get safe enough, they'll ask some more questions. Okay, and that brings us to number two. There are two sources for answers to those questions. Either we can look out into the world and get answers, which are the incorrect answers to the issues of life, or we can check what the scriptures have to say. What does God have to say? What does the experience of Christians for 2,000 years have to say? There is a great cloud of witnesses, by the way. And so we can get right answers. And by the way, I'm involved in Christian education. This is a major job of Christian schools to give good answers, satisfactory answers. God has built us in his own image. And part of his image is intellect, the ability to reason. And another part of his image is emotion, how we feel. Okay, so what we're talking about in number two right here is basically intellect, although there's some emotion involved with this. Okay, so let's just assume now we've gotten some right answers. We move on to number three. And I could, we could talk about this probably the rest of the evening, number three. But it has to do with integrity. How can I be honest with God and with other people and with myself. This is huge. And when a young person or whoever is being led by the Holy Spirit to deal with this, if you get this right, the sooner you get this right, the sooner you can move on to number four here. But we need to park and talk about this because this is a huge struggle. Let's review a little bit. Here's stage two. Here's stage three. The innocence of childhood, eventually we come to the age of accountability, and because we're bent to evil, we involve ourselves in the sins of the flesh, such as immorality or theft and those kinds of things, or sins of the spirit, such as jealousy or covetousness. But in our heart of hearts, we know that there has to be justice and morality. If there's anything the school children are sensitive to, it's fair whether something is fair or not. Think back to your children or whenever you were young. Okay? So then there's a stage three, which we have to go through before we get up here to stage four. And I don't want to go any further with that for right now. Okay, so we're going to focus more on this thing of integrity. Man both seeks truth and flees from it. 
integrity. It seems so right, but we're afraid to be that way. If there's something, there's like this ambivalence going on inside of us. We don't know what to do with this. And this is part of this question, whether we're going to choose integrity or not. Though a man flees from truth, he does not stop seeking it as well. It's the way God built us. We need truth in order to live. The love of truth is the source of all harmony within oneself. When we get this thing figured out, that integrity is primary, that a lot of blocks fall into place. Now, what do I mean by all that? Well, look at this. With this integrity issue, <clears throat> one of my boys wanted a four-wheel drive pickup when he uh, turned 18. He didn't want a car because four-wheel drive pickup can do anything, as you men know. And so um, one day, after he had this four-wheel drive pickup, I got a call from him. And he said, Father, I think God's trying to teach me some humility. I said, well, what happened? He says, well, I rolled my truck. Well, what happened? Well, I was going down this gravel road. His brother was with him in, the car, in this truck. They were both belted in. I was driving down this gravel road. It got real close to the end of the road. There was a little slight curve. And he said, I slid in the gravel, and it, it rolled. But it rolled right back up in its wheels again. Okay, so we had to go get it fixed. But, you know, four-wheel drive trucks can do anything. So one day after it was fixed, he was heading to church on a Sunday morning, and it had just rained. And in Texas, a lot of tar comes to the surface of the roads because it's so hot. Well, this rain had fallen on this tar, and he was driving around down the road, and he said, I went around this slight curve like this, and he says, my back end of my pickup just kind of slow motion, just came around like this. And he said, we hit the edge of the road, and it they flipped right upside down into the water. This time, it was not up on its four wheels. And his Bible's floating in the water, he was going to lead songs that morning, and his, his songbook is floating in the water. And so he un unhitches himself. I was supposed to preach that morning. They didn't even tell me what was going on, but they told my wife, and she went over to him and took care of him. But that ended the four-wheel drive pickup. Now, slid on the gravel one time, and he hydroplaned the other time. Is that the real issue? What was the real issue? Speed. He was going too fast. But you see, a young man who's driving a four-wheel pickup, they can do anything, right? Speed is not the issue in their minds. Okay, so if you're a young man, that's what you say. Well, you know, I slid in the gravel or I hydroplaned. But that's called spin. The real issue, he's going too fast. But what young man wants to admit that? Okay, so that's where spin comes. This is pretty difficult. Even adults are sometimes tempted to spin an answer to a question. So it doesn't look quite so bad. Okay? Okay, so truth-telling, saying it the way it is, is integrity. And it might hurt a little bit. It might be a little bit embarrassing, but we're free. You see, if we have to spin it, then we have to kind of control things, right? Got to manage stuff so the story stays consistent. But if we say it the way it is, we're free. That's a big deal. Okay, moving on. You know, the scripture is pretty clear about doubleness. He says, can a fountain yield both salt water and fresh? Does a fig tree bear olive berries? He says, my brethren, these things ought not so to be. Double. Out of speaking out of one side of mouth and to another person out of another side of mouth. That's double tongue. Double. That's not right. But humanity feels like under the situation, when I'm with this kind of people, then I need to say this. But when I'm with this kind of people, then I need to say this. So I'm going to stay in good graces with each kind of people. Duh. That's not integrity. That's doubleness. Keeping commitments. You know, if we say we're going to do something, we just do it. Not cheating. My very first year of school, I taught way back. Back in the days before the indoor, indoor plumbing. 
So one day, a little boy in my school came to me and he said, so-and-so dumped his lunch down the outhouse hole. I said, oh. So I got the little boy accused and I said, did you dump your lunch down the outhouse hole? No. Okay, somebody's lying here. It's the job of a teacher. You can't let lies go. And by the way, it's the job of a parent also to catch the lies. Okay. So I talked to the other school children. Nobody seems to know anything about this. And it, was, it made a little ruckus at school, I guess. And so I met this, the mother of the boy being accused at night, at, at church that night. And she said, if he said he didn't do it, he didn't do it. So I went to school the next morning. And I, so I got this little boy up who was being accused. I said, if I would give you less swats, would you admit that you did it? Mm-hmm. It was out. The boy was so good at lying that he had his mother around his finger. That's not okay. That's a very poor foundation for life. And that's the job of parents. Little children by nature are liars. You know, you were a little child. We know what it's like. Well, all our children are just as bad as we were. And we've got to catch them. And it's also the job of teachers to catch people or children who are lying in school and cheating. It's not okay. It becomes a life pattern. Not shading the truth. We won't go any further there. Objective. What's the, what does objective mean? What's its parallel on the other side? If you're not objective, what are you? Subjective. So what's objective? Pardon? It's just true or false, okay? So what's subjective then? Okay, it depends a little bit uh, how you feel about it, okay? Well, truth or integrity is all about being objective. Not how you feel about it, just the way it is. Okay, so this one right here, non-prejudiced. Okay, let me share this with you. Do you, people up here in Pennsylvania aren't prejudiced. You don't struggle with this thing, do you? Okay, so <laughs> I come from Texas, at least years ago, I don't know if they still do this, but if a black man swims in a white person's swimming pool, you've got to drain the water out and replace it so that a white person can swim in there. Okay? I don't know if they still do that, but that's the story of the past. Well, I went and had some meetings up in Minnesota, and I found out that the prejudice is against Native Americans in Minnesota. And then I went, and I actually lived in northern Indiana for eight years, and I discovered the prejudice there is against Amish. I think that prejudice is just a human problem. So what do we mean by prejudice? Well, prejudice has, simply means people prejudged. It has to do with subjectivity, how I feel, no factual basis. You know, we have, all our, we have stories on this. It's moral judgment is prejudice based on nothing. No factual basis. It's just, it's like you say, I don't like that guy because that, well, he has a white beard. Duh. What does that have to do with my person, my value as a person? But human beings are that way. It's like, don't confuse me with the facts. I've already made up my mind. You might have bumped into people like that already, and maybe you've found that in yourself. Okay, so the Holocaust was created because Hitler was able to convince the German people that the Jews had inferior genes. And since we want a pure Aryan race, we need to get rid of the bad genes in society so we could have this master race. And it's this kind of prejudice that drove the Holocaust. Okay, so race is still an issue in this country. I don't want to go further. But uh, we don't have any really problems with race, I guess. But we do have fads, Mennonite fads, the cool stuff. It's just amazing. I'm 69 years old. The present cool is not the same as the cool back in the 60s. They had other kinds of cool back then. If some of you would see what was cool back then, you'd giggle or laugh or say, What were they thinking? Why did they do things like that? I'm talking about Mennonites now. But 
You know, when something gets cool, it doesn't really matter how silly it is. You just do it because it's cool. Okay? But if you tell a young person not to be cool, it's like you're making him sick. It's terrible. You have to be cool. You have to fit in. You don't want to be rejected. If you're not cool, you're, you're a reject, social reject. All that has to do with prejudice. And uh, I suppose you folks don't struggle with any kind of social status up here, such as wealth. Certain family names are not more important than other family names. Uh, I'm sure you don't have any problem with celebrity and uh, sports. Okay, I could, never, I could never figure this out. Why somebody wants to favor this team, they're, they say they're fans of this team, and other people are fans of this team. I, I have, to this day, I have no idea why they would be that way. I guess it's, it's a kind of prejudice, but anyway. It's the tyranny of everybody does it. It's a kind of tyranny. I'm not free to make my own choices because I am prejudiced. Okay? Well, any kind of prejudice is integrity failure. It's not okay. It's not objective. It's subjective. To have integrity, our public voice must be aligned with our private voice. Here are some examples of misalignment. Oh, no. I was thinking to 8.30. That was my ju poor judgment. Oh, I'm so sorry. Okay, I'll just say that what I have to say in five minutes. I, I won't get finished. If I say to you, if that's what you want me to do, I'm happy to do it. But I say to myself, why can't I ever say no? I hate myself for being such a coward. That's doubleness. Or if I say to you, I, didn't know, I know you didn't mean what you said the other day. You were just having a bad day. But I say to myself, that's the last time I will trust you. You've crossed the line for good. Or, sure, Betty, I'd love to get together for lunch sometime. But inside I say, not in a thousand years would I have a one-on-one -on -one lunch with you. Life's too short. Or I say, I'm sure I can do it. Let me give it a shot. But I say to myself, I've just set myself up for a huge failure. Now everyone will find out how incompetent I really am. See, that's misalignment. There's no integrity there. Okay, so this next thing I have to share about insinuations in UN is dangerous, and so I don't know. I've got to trust somebody. Okay, I was at Elmer's house, and I learned to know Michael, so I at least know these two men. Okay. So if I would say to Michael here, do you know a man by the name of Roger uh, Elmer Zimmerman? Do you know a man like that? I do. Just be careful. Not saying anything, just be careful. Okay. Sometime uh, Elmer comes to me and he says, I hear you were telling bad stories about me. And I said, No. Is that true? Is that true? I gave the impression. Literally, I did not say anything. So I could justify myself that I'm telling the truth, but I gave a message. And I gave a false message to the person who asked me. Because I did communicate something to you about that man. And so it's called legalism. When you go by the letter of the law, but you've really broken it. That's not integrity. That's an integrity failure. Okay, some of these other things on here, consistent. Honoring promises even if it hurts, keeping confidences, guileless, no hypocrisy. You know, if there's anything that causes young people to leave churches, it's this one right here. An integrity failure of the older people in the church who are, young people can see, are hypocritical. Who wants that? Young people are idealistic. They want models. They want heroes of integrity. 
If they see the older people in their church playing the religious game of being hypocritical while talking good things, are they going to believe that? Are they going to believe the message? No, forget it all. Okay. Um, I'm not very good at asking if you want to talk about anything before I quit, so here's my chance. I'm just going to have to stop partway through this. I apologize, um, but I'll give you a few minutes. Do you have anything you want to talk about so far that we said tonight?